Hello, everyone. This is Mark Plaster, Senior Executive Editor of Emergency Physicians Monthly, and you're listening to EP Talk, the place where emergency physicians, aka ER docs, uh, come to talk about things that are important to us, both professional and personal. And today's guest is Dominic Bagnoli, and he is the one of the founders, if not the brainchild founder of uh, what I, for years, called Emergency Medicine Physicians, and now it's called Use. USACS or USACS. I'm still not used to that, Dom, but um, that's what you are and have been for several years now. So, congratulations! Yeah. And 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 I, I brought Dom on board today because um, uh, several years ago now, uh, you guys had grown quite a bit, and you you brought in equity partners, and you were I brought you in actually. We talked about that at the time about why you did that and what the advantages were for both you and for emergency physicians generally. And I want to kind of start there and you tell the story of, I get, was it still US? It was EMP and became USACS. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was uh, the legacy group. Our original group was called Emergency Medicine Physicians, EMP, and was established in 1992. Three mm -hmm. docs, one hospital, single democratic yep. group, and then decided to grow the business. We grew it over, you know, from 92 to 2015. And in 2015, we partnered with Welsh Carson, a private equity firm, to form U.S. Acute Care Solutions, USACS. Yeah. And uh, that, that's how we got to USACS. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, uh, yeah. And, I, you know, the, the bottom line and the question I get asked all the time is why would we do that? You know, there's so much right. around CMGs and private equity and physicians getting taken advantage of. But but we as a group of physicians made the decision to to do that in order to kind of bring other groups like us together. Because if right. you remember back then, there were a couple of transactions where a couple of the large competitors who were public bought a couple other Democratic groups and our physicians voted to to partner with Welsh Carson because we thought that we could create a third option for physicians, right? In the past, it was stay independent, fight the good fight, or sell out and be an employee. We wanted to create a model where physicians could continue to own their business. I, I think that uh, a lot of uh, uh, emergency physicians not being uh, uh, maybe entrepreneurs or business people, certainly not finance people, don't understand what a private equity partner actually is because they've seen emergency physician groups, and don't need to name them, who've sold out to trash haulers. <laughs> I mean, uh, to a variety of uh, different kinds of uh, companies that have a large amount of, uh, large amount of cash. And as you say, um, they uh, sometimes, uh, they certainly cashed out for the, the guys who had put a lot of, you know, sweat equity into, into the, uh, the group. Um, but at the same time, often didn't really understand the ins and outs of what the a professional group was like. The the physicians working for them oftentimes didn't feel that they were understood or certainly not represented. And oftentimes it didn't work. And, uh, and many times it actually failed. And I, and I remember talking to you about this, that your partners really were essentially creating uh, the, uh, the bank, so to speak, to allow you guys to have the the finances to bring people together because that's an expensive, risky operation. If right. I, am I understanding that correctly? Is that yeah. the you know private equity firms are firms that raise capital, raise money from investors, and then they invest that money in businesses. And if they invest a dollar, they want to make two or three dollars in return. Sure. And, and that's just an investment vehicle. So when healthcare professionals or any business partners with private equity, the critical point is who do you partner with and how much control do you give up? So the big difference between our transaction in 2015 and all the other transactions out there is we brought on a private equity partner who had a ton of experience in healthcare specifically yep. and understood the value of physician ownership we're willing to take a minority position, not a controlling position, to partner with us to aggregate the market. And they felt that they could make money doing that. And we as physicians would make money at the same time. So that's the big difference between our transaction and all these other ones. It was with a partner who understood they were gonna play a minority transitional role, not a majority take control, take it public role, but a role that was gonna help us achieve our dreams and our goals but also give them the ability to make some money. And, and, you know, that, that, that's basically how the business ran. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So 
now you've reversed that. And uh, is that the result of COVID? And let's talk about what's happened in the last year, because I mean, uh, it's no secret. I mean, for the first time ever, ever in my in my life, we have uh, residency classes who are graduating, and some of those some of those graduates don't have jobs. They're, they're, the market has has uh, just uh, withered, and uh, uh, so a lot of people. And and, and so I'm I'm listening and actually going to do a podcast uh, soon with uh, a, a uh, emerging medicine resident uh, who wrote a piece talking about the future for her class and for, you know, subsequent classes in emergency medicine and uh, whether the jobs are still going to be there. And uh, I think they are, but I, I want to hear your, I want to hear your take on it. And I want to hear what this uh, movement that you've done, this uh, financial movement you've done, how that's going to impact people. So, yeah, so I think it's going to be very helpful. So let's first talk about for the first time ever, you know, there's not jobs. Why is that? Volume's 85%. And in the past, residents would come out, they'd be hired to cover growth and retiring physicians. Well, for the first time ever, we have 15% less patients. So most small groups don't need another partner. Right. Most, most medium-sized groups are saying, hey, we can't afford to hire and support someone. That's the beauty of our business because where other groups are gonna say, well, we're not gonna hire them unless we need them because that affects our bottom line. We have a long-term vision. So our vision is we know volume will get back to 90, 95. It'll start to grow again because yeah. we provide a vital service to the community. You know, we're an essential service and there was no better time than what our clinicians did in the last year. I mean, I couldn't be more proud. You know, I, I got involved seeing patients on telemedicine for the first time in a while because there was such a need. I didn't go in to the EDs like everyone else in our company did, but every day they went in, put their lives their health, their family's health on the line, that's an essential service for you. And I could be <laughs> more prouder that I was an emergency physician than over the last 12 months. So now we have a chance where these physicians need jobs. We need to create them for them. We need to hire them, bring them on and, and, and have positions for them as we grow because they are the future of the specialty. And that's what our yeah. focus has been in creating a physician ownership model so we can make long-term decisions not short term, and, and it's tough. Everyone went through the same thing. We chose, we had to cut physicians hours back because we didn't need them. I mean, if you only got 40 patients right. coming in the door instead of 80, you don't need all those physicians. And it made no sense to have more physicians than you needed exposing themselves. So our physician said, okay, we'll work less. We didn't cut their benefits. We didn't cut their pay. We just said, we need less right now. Stay home, spend some time with your family, stay isolated, stay safe. When it comes back, we'll bring back the hours. And as partners, they all benefited from that. So we actually did as well as we would have done if COVID wouldn't have hit because we were able to make those decisions. Uh, and so from the standpoint of the residents coming out, what I would say is, you know, find a group that's going to hire you for the long term. People that are focused on growth, that are willing to say, hey, some of the older docs will take a little less time because we don't need your hours right now, but we'll make sure you get 100 hours a month or 120 be flexible to take less hours to be there and part of the group as it grows. Yeah. You know, you guys have uh, your uh, reputation has always been the youth of uh, and I, I don't mean I don't see that disparaging. I, I think see that as a real vibrant part of what uh, USACS has been. Um, uh, you guys always had the best parties for sure at uh, ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> we get grief for that too. You know, we get grief for that. Our physicians work hard all year. And 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 20 years ago, we said, you know, we're going to get people together at ASAP and we're going to have not only a good time for the people that have worked all year, but yeah. also people that want to join us. And so, so you know, I see both sides of that. I see people say, oh, they're spending money on parties. But from my perspective, it's like we have a philosophy, work hard, play hard. We like each other. We, our group, there's a lot of camaraderie. And so the opportunity to, to let loose once a year, I don't see what's wrong with that in an organization. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, the, please don't take that as a, as a kind of a sideways uh, compliment. It, it, it was the ones that I always look forward to. But no, I, and, and, but I was mainly thinking of the energy and the, uh, the youthfulness of your entire group. And you're exactly right. I mean, people... Uh, your group it, uh, has EPM, uh, EMP, and uh, and USACS has always been a very vibrant group, and you know, and I've even seen that from a publisher standpoint in the 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 ads that you guys have put in our publication. They reflect uh, 
a forward-looking, uh, young um, uh, future ownership. I always enjoyed uh, the um, the marketing thing that you guys did about hey, you know, be a, be a, be an owner, be a part of this. And uh, I think that I always thought that was great. So I I appreciate that you guys are taking care of uh, this uh, b people that are coming in uh, in the younger. Um, the new residents that you're hiring for that very, very reason. I know that there will be a lot of loyalty as a result of that. And um, yeah, so. I, I think, you know, and listen, uh, the legacy group EMP really went away in 2015, right? And now USACS is made up of, you know, we did 15 mergers, ESP of Texas, MEP, Tampa Bay Emergency Physicians, EPPH out of Denver. I could go on and on. Apex out of Denver, Urgentis. I mean, there were there was 15 groups, all 100% physician owned, who democratically decided that they were better partnering together with USACS for the long term to maintain ownership than staying independent. And now those groups that have all come together and and have decided that the best thing for us was to to find a way to finance and buy Welsh Carson out. They did get a return on their investment, but the docs got the exact same return. The difference was Welsh Carson knew it was transit, they left, the docs knew it was long-term. So when you look at our current deal, and we can get into that and I can explain it, but our docs, many of them didn't sell a share. I didn't sell a share in the transaction. I rolled everything. Why? Because I believe in the future of this organization. And a lot of our docs, about 40% of our docs did not sell a share. 30% no. of the docs bought shares. And then and then there was another, you know, 30% that said, I'd like to take some money off the table. And guess what? Later in their careers, wanting to take some risk off the table. And that's the beauty of owning a group and having the ability to make those decisions instead of having those decisions made for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Now you've kind of set it up. Tell me, tell me about the the nitty gritty of of how USACS uh, uh, bought out uh, Car Carson. Is it Carson Equity? Welsh Carson. Welsh. Yeah, Welsh Carson. And Welsh Carson is a is a large organization. They do technology and healthcare only. Very successful since 1979. Great partners. Nothing but good things to say about how how they helped us grow our business. Um, what we did was we really did a, a refinancing of the business, and now we partnered with a a new firm called Apollo Hybrid Value Fund, who basically are gives us capital, gives us money that mm -hmm. we then pledge to pay back like a loan, uh, and we use that money to do really buy out Welsh Carson 100% and to give our physicians liquidity, right? To, to allow physicians to have the options to take some money off the table if they wanted to. And so that sets us up with a uh, uh, the ability to grow now. We're going to go out and grow again. We're going to go out to all the groups that maybe decided not to join us before. They wanted to stay independent. But our, our mission now is to continue to bring physician ownership groups together. And three to five years from now, there'll be another transaction. So when we did the Welsh Carson deal, everyone said, well, what's going to happen? You're going to sell out the team or you're going to you're going to go public or this is going to happen. Welsh Carson is going to take control. And I told everyone that's not going to happen because we've structured our deal in a way that they're minority partners and we have control and we'll decide as physicians, what do we want to do? This yeah. is the same type of transaction. We have control that in three to five years, we can decide what we want to do. And it may be it may be just buy them out, pay them off and be done with them. It may be, you know, do something different. I don't know, but the physicians will decide. And to me, it's all about developing and maintaining a model where physicians can do what they do best at the bedside, taking care of patients, delivering care, and letting them not worry about the business side, giving them enough security, resources, technology, capital, so they can do their job, and then letting them benefit and whatever comes of that, you know, if the company triples in value, their ownership triples in value. If the company goes bankrupt, they go bankrupt. But that's right. like any business. Well, any business that you're an owner of, you see, that, that that's the key. You know, if uh, if you're the owner and everybody else is employees and it goes bankrupt, they all go find another job. And and yeah. some docs some docs have wanted that, and that's the reason why they're 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 not part of a, a you know a an EMP uh, USACS contract, um, but if you want to be an owner uh, and take a little risk, you know, is there, the, the question is, do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in your group? Okay. Uh, are we going to provide a service or, or is this hospital going to be, you know, uh, are we going to 
get booted out of here because of something completely unrelated to me and and I'll go packing and I'll have to move again. If that's the case, well then just give me a paycheck and I'll just go home and I'll fish. And yeah. uh, whereas you guys have always had the idea that, nope, you're a part of the group, you own it, uh, you're gonna benefit from it, you're gonna lose if we if we screw up and we lose the contract, you're gonna and you're gonna win if we we get this contract and another contract. So uh, I, I admire you for that. Let me uh, let me ask you something here. Um, how big? I didn't realize you guys had that many additional contracts this year. How how many hospitals? How, 200, how, 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 270 sites uh, right now. Yeah, 270 sites and six around six million visits this year. Uh, we do about. 85% is still 80, 85% is ER, and then we do integrated acute care, which is hospitals and ER. We observation medicine, in, uh, intensive care medicine. We've, you know, a lot of the other groups have started to do anesthesiology, radiology, all those things. We've kind of said our 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 niche is is unscheduled care, acute care, from symptom to discharge. We can be a value as a as a partner to the health system there. And so that's where we've kind of stayed. You know, that includes virtual care and urgent care and observation medicine. ED is our core, you know, uh, and and hospitalists and intensivists are, are things that we think we can we can continue to do. So we'll we'll grow in each of those markets. I mean, um, you know, your comments about some physicians don't want to take the risk. I am totally fine with that. I mean, we we yeah, need sure. great academic physicians that that develop and train residents. You know, some of them are at academic programs where the dean takes a piece, right? Um, <laughs> some of them don't have to worry about revenue or what kind of, you know, RCM function they have because they just gave a salary. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a small independent group. There's nothing wrong with the regional group. Everyone has to choose. We just chose, decided that physician ownership was the key, scale was important, and having the capital to bring like-minded groups together was essential to being successful. That's why we did that in 15. And now today we're doing what we're doing because we think getting it back to 100% physician owned is really the long-term value of what this organization can be. Do you, do you think the economic, uh, um, you think the downturn, uh, did you do it now because the downturn and volumes made it more palatable for your financial partners to to get out you know and did they say i don't know if this is going to go i think I'll, I'll i'll back at were you in no. a better bargaining position because of that no it was never a bargain i mean you know when you have a partner it's more about hey what's what's the right thing for both of us here and so when you start the when you start the relationship we, you know, it's not like we got married. We're going to be married for life. We knew that we were we were yeah. going to be partners for five to seven years, and the goals were to 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 increase the value of the shares for everyone, docs and and uh, the the partner, but also to find the right transition that we would control. So when they when they take a minority position, and that's the big deal. That if you can go out and get someone to say, I'll 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 take thirty percent, I'll let you control the business. We'll be helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you're ready to, to take us out, we're okay with that. Then it, it's kind of a prearranged outcome. And so yeah. it was very collaborative. I mean, I, I know that private equity gets a bad name and mainly it's because there are some bad actors that do things and don't really realize that this, this business, our business, everything is generated. What happens in that 12 to 18 minutes at the bedside, right? Yeah. That's where all the money's generated. Everything else is about improving that, collecting that, but you have to get that right. So by having physicians aligned and APPs working together to deliver the highest quality care, and then having the business infrastructure to do all the rest, there's no way that a 10 physician group in one site can do a better job. It's just impossible because they don't have the resources. Now, right. You know, not saying that that they shouldn't continue to do that business and it may be fine, but they have risk just like everybody else. So I, I just think that when you really think about the model and you think about healthcare in general, you know, if, if things get worse, if, if things get, we used to say this, hey, if volume goes down 20 percent, we'll just adjust the staffing. We'll be fine. Well, it did. It went down 40 percent. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, did in our, it did in our shop. That's for sure. But 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 you know what? Every physician, they're still OK. I mean, we're doing right. a lot better than most, and right. and we have the and we have the ability to say we're there and we're there for our patients, 
And those of us that don't see patients all the time, I, I take great pride that I help our 3,000 clinicians deliver better care, right? I'm not doing it anymore. I did it for a while during COVID on doing telemedicine, but but I'm not doing it day to day, but I know I'm helping them make it easier for them to do that. And that, and that's what the business is about, really. I mean, you know, if, if we didn't have that kind of, if we didn't have that kind of passion about what we do, we would all, I mean, and I think that's why some groups sell their whole group or leave or retire. They just lose their passion for what they're doing. Our group, you know, it's, right. it, it, it's got a real passion for what we believe in. Yeah, part of that is your youth, uh, actually. Uh, um, you are a youth, uh, I would say youth heavy, uh, or you're a younger group, if you will. Uh, and you make a point of keeping it young, because I think that you, you do a, a pretty good job of recruiting um, physicians directly out of residency and, and in their first five years of training, uh, post-training. So uh, you mentioned something I'm going to uh, put you on the spot uh, and ask you about, and, and that it's the, the shift from full um, uh, eight, from physicians to uh, advanced uh, practice providers. I know a lot of people in this uh, in this market are looking with a with a careful eye at uh, whether they're going to be replaced um, by an APP because of uh, you know uh, um, financial cons uh, constraints. I'd like for you to address that if you would. Yeah, I don't. I don't think uh, physicians will ever be replaced by APPs. Okay, first of all, I think there are certain there are there are certain parts of our business that we love doing, right? Mm -hmm. And every physician's different. Some I used to say I love nursemaids elbows. I used to love doing those, right? <laughs> Some guys love trauma. Some guys love love you know uh, cardiac. But but the idea is there is a a ton of work that needs to be done in the emergency department. And as hospitals cut back. The services they provide and we've seen that over the last 10 years you know you used to have a rn and lpn a tech i mean now you're lucky to get one right and right. so by by partnering with apps as clinicians our our focus is on training them to give them the best skills they can they work collaboratively with our physicians so they're a team it's not to replace a doc it's really to provide better care more hands-on care to the patient and and we find APPs to do a great job. The quality is great. I know there's people who think that we're going to just have all these APPs and docs won't be able to get a job. I, I don't I don't see that. I don't see that at all because I think in the end, patients still want to see docs a lot of the times. But if you have a doc and an APP working together, running a department, those are the most efficient departments we have. Yeah. Would you say that your percentage of physician to advanced practice provider ratio uh, within your groups has remained relatively stable or do you find that, uh, uh, do you have a, a handle on what those numbers are and how they might be changing? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, here's, if, if you've got less than 25 or 30,000 visits, you probably don't have any APPs in your department at all, right? Right. Um, right. And then once you start to grow, you start adding them in. Mm -hmm. uh, and it depends on your your volumes, your average volumes, what your actual ratio is. So that's true. I don't know that number for sure. I mean, we've seen we've seen APPs and other specialties, you know, uh, manage hospitals in the middle of the night when no one wants to critical access places. I mean, right. think about when you think about APPs, if your mom or dad lived in an area where there's a critical access hospital, would you rather have a highly trained APP there overnight or no one? Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's absolutely uh, correct. You know, in my career as a locums, one of my uh, uh, hospital assignments was Joplin, Missouri. And mm -hmm. Joplin, Missouri is down at the four corners of Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. And there isn't anything else out there uh, besides St. John's and St. Luke's. I mean, and yeah. St. John's was a trauma center. And I can tell you the number of times I was talking to a, uh, a PA from uh, um, Southeast uh, Kansas, and he was the only guy there. I mean, yeah. he, and he, he was the, he was, he was the man. He was, he was, he was handling everything and, and they were doing a great job and, and under some very, very difficult circumstances because they, they had no backup. None, zero. Me, it was me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was me at uh, at St. John's, and uh, um, 
uh, in Joplin that was back in the sky up and, and, and with a helicopter and, and everything else going. And so, no, my I have a great deal of respect, but I also want to make sure that they're being used appropriately and not eventually kind of pushing us out. And, and, and my fear, of course, is that we would, uh, that the, eventually we would diminish the quality of care. Uh, yeah. And if we if we start to do that uh, and push more and more responsibility over onto an APP, then I, I think that we'll we'll regret it as especially in, as a, as a uh, in medicine in general. So I I remember it was probably 1994 when we hired our first APP. We were a single hospital group. Roger Basiletti. <laughs> Roger was our first PA, and I remember the first shift I worked with him and. And I, I, I had just come out of residency and, and I wasn't, I was like, well, does this really make sense? But once you start, you know, when you're running a department and they're part of the team, it really is like, why would you practice any other way? You've got an extra set of hands, um, you know, the ability to, to deliver better care. And I think we've, we've grown that program uh, over the last 30 years. And, and I think now, they play a huge part of our our practice. They're they're viewed as colleagues. Their quality is as good. We monitor it just like we would monitor a physician. Uh, uh, and 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 maybe someone somewhere will say, hey, some hospital system somewhere will say, let's get of all get rid of docs and use APPs. That's not what our organization do. We're physician owned. We're going to yeah. use APPs as partners collaboratively when it makes sense, as long as the quality doesn't go down, and as long as it helps us provide better care. Yeah. One of the questions I want to pose to you is, uh, uh, again, it goes back to workforce. Um, because of the, the size of uh, USACS, you're starting to get a real feel for uh, workforce issues that are facing the specialty. And one of the things, one of the questions that the residents are coming up with uh, is, are we overtraining? Are we, are we training too many uh, residents? Um, and as a person as a company that's hiring uh, residents coming out. Uh, I'd like to know your perspective. First off, does you, USACS, are you staffing uh, residencies right now? If, you're, if so, kind of where are they? Yeah, we are. We, we, we definitely staff uh, residencies and I, and I don't believe that we're over training. I, I, I believe that emergency physicians are trained to practice in emergency departments, but their skill set goes far beyond that. I think, I think our ability as emergency physicians to be CMOs, to manage hospitalist programs, to manage anything in the acute care arena. So the more emergency physicians that we can train, the, the easier it is to replace those positions as more of our colleagues are taking other roles. And so I, I don't see a, a, an overtraining or there's not enough um, uh, positions. Now, the, the problem is everybody wants the positions in Denver or Columbus or Charlotte or Austin. You know, nobody wants to be, unless they're from that area, no one wants to be in the areas that aren't as desirable from a, where to live. So there may be this feeling like, hey, there's, there's no jobs here in these towns uh, or in these cities I want to be in. Do we have too many physicians? But when you look globally across the country, I mean, if you want to make a real impact in in healthcare, if you want to make a real impact in the delivery of care for patients, <clears throat> you know, regardless of the ability to pay, because we're there 24-7, 365, I think the more emergency physicians we can train, the better. You know, I, I happen to agree with that. And, and especially, you know, we, we launched Telemedicine Magazine um, uh, several years ago because of my vision is that uh, emergency medicine, we've waited in the ER for people to come to us. And I think that one of the things that the pandemic has taught us is that we can start to push out. Uh, and I think that as we can start to use, it, you know, emergency medicine has been a delivery model. And I think that as we evolve, I think the emergency department could start pushing into the community, providing pre-hospital care, not just transportation, yep. Yep. diagnostic skills uh, that go in and and get the right person to the right, uh, get the patient to the right uh, place at the right time uh, using uh, a variety of technologies and the brains that we have sitting in the emergency department. And my best example of that is the people who are starting to look at elder care and uh, trying to uh, prevent unnecessary, not only, not only prevent unnecessary transports, 
but also not having that threshold decision of is this person, patient sick and needs to come to the emergency department made by some young, uneducated provide, uh, you know, um, uh, nurse's aid at night uh, with no with no help. Yep. Uh, and and I, some of the, the emergency departments that have really, I think, stepped into that, that space uh, by actively using PAs, uh, in, uh, even paramedics, using tel uh, telemetry and a variety of instruments to provide uh, diagnostic, uh, um, you know, um, services in the field, you know, in a, in a, uh, either in home or in a nursing care. I think that's a huge expansion of, of who we are. And I personally think that uh, we've only barely tapped that. I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think COVID has accelerated that five years, right? Five to 10 years acceleration because, you know, everyone's like, oh, we'll do telemedicine. We'll see how it works. And patients didn't experience it because they hadn't, you know, either their payers hadn't approved it or they right. hadn't had experience with it. And then all of a sudden last March and April, people are trying to get screened, people are asking questions and everyone got on the telemedicine. The telemedicine market went through the roof. It was overloaded. Physicians were being begged to see the patients. And, and I got involved at that time and we saw the patients. And I, to me, it's like, it's like if you go back 10 years ago and said, I'm going to get my you know, my groceries or my books through the mail, I'm just going to go on the computer and get delivered. You would have said, that's crazy. That's where healthcare is going. I mean, any yeah. health that can be delivered virtually, you know, uh, will be. And yeah. if, it, if it can't be delivered that way, at least the screening of those patients or the management of patients, Jim Augustine, one of our partners and, you know, Jim for a long time, yeah. Mm -hmm. used to talk about, I remember when I was a resident, Jim was an attending, and he would talk about the command center where the emergency physician would sit in the middle of the emergency department with all these monitors, all the things, and they would just direct everything that happened. You know, that's where we're going. And it's not yeah. going to be directing in the ED, it's going to be directing in the community. And that's why right. I think training more emergency physicians, our skill set, you know, my wife's a gin onk, right? She knows about women's cancer, but she doesn't know about the other things. We know that first hour of everything. Like we are the yeah. perfect trained physicians to manage anything like that. And that's why this specialty is so exciting. I mean, that's why I went into it, right? Because I think it's just it's just great to be on that front lines. Whatever comes through the door, you can handle. And that's yeah. what's really exciting about emergency medicine. If you looked at all the times that people are going to Google and they're trying to find out what is going on, yep. and you said, if you if the, 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 there was just a little key down there at the bottom and it said, would you like to talk to a doctor about this? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know how many gazillion calls you would get? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and the care would improve. The care right. would improve because right. uh, the peace of mind, no, that probably is not cancer. It's uh, it's probably this. Uh, let me ask you a few more questions and I, we can try some things, uh, you know, right. and uh, uh, because if people think that the dis that the demand for healthcare is less, I think they're misunderstanding. The demand right. for healthcare is significantly higher, uh, and and by using the right kind of scalable uh, people with skills, I mean I think we have the ability to direct them in the right way. And as you say, we have the breadth of understanding and and knowledge to be able to knowledgeably speak uh, to those things. Yeah, it would take if it would if Google or Amazon or someone in that technology world would realize how valuable that would be to the community, to the patients, to their brand. And then we could find a way for a payer to determine that paying for that is cheaper than not paying for that. Then I know of a national emergency group with a, thousands of physicians who <laughs> own their business who would love to be part of something like that. I mean, that's that's the vision of the future where our physicians have the ability to make those decisions and do those things, right? Yeah. And and that's the future. I really believe that that our physicians will be working not just inside the four walls of the ED, but our organization will play a much larger role in the future. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're absolutely right with having the uh, the continuum during mm -hmm. the start at home or the street. We, we you know we're already in the street with with uh, EMTs. Let's start in the home with uh, advanced practice providers or PA, uh, paramedics or whatever. Start there, flow all the way through into the hospital where there are people flowing back and forth who understand where that patient is going, either hospitalist or intensivist. 
if that's all part of the same same group and they're all communicating with one another, I I personally think that's a, a huge improvement in care, Absolutely. and and a real opportunity you know, for those of us who who play a, a, a pivotal role in that. Yep. Yep. So, so anyway, uh, I think we're getting close to the end of our time here. I, I've, I've been watching the uh, the ticker here, and I uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity if you have any saved rounds here that you'd like to to say <laughs> about uh, uh, U, USACS. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> no, uh, listen. Uh, I, I think that I'm really excited, and my partners are really excited uh, about the future, right? And I think that we've created in 2015 an organization that would give large-scaled national physician organization the opportunity to be successful. I think we've we've jumped over the first hurdle now, and now we're prepared to to continue to grow. And so, you know. We're looking for groups just like we did in 2015 that that are physician owned that say we don't want to we don't want to sell out and be employees. We're not ready to hang the the cleats up, um, but we also know that there's some value of scale. And if we can find the right group to partner with, then we're interested. So you know we're out, we're open for the doors are open. Like if there's groups out there that want to do it, if there's individual physicians, either new grads or physicians who want to be part of something for the long term that is around, you know, believing in the physician ownership. I know it's not for everyone and there's people who think we're the we're the worst thing that's ever happened to emergency medicine and and I respect their opinions. I just happen to disagree with them. And I think that uh, 5 years from now hopefully there'll be another transaction and you'll be going, "Wow, you actually did do what you said you're going to do." Cuz I think if people look back at what we've said even back to the 90s, we said we were going to build a physician practice that was going to be built around physician ownership, high quality care, and we've done that. And now we've we've taken a couple other big steps here to make sure that exists for the long term. And that and that's what we're doing. We're excited about it. I I couldn't be happier to to still play a small role as I'm now the board chairman. So um, I'm not as involved day to day, but some some people still call me the uh, the uh, you know the cheerleader. I guess um, uh, I've been here from the beginning, and I'm going to be here till the end. And I'm excited about it. Uh, cool. And I'm hoping we can continue to to help physicians and APPs deliver the care and partner with the hospitals in the right way. So I appreciate you giving us the time to kind of tell the story and and answer some of the questions because it's unbelievable what's out there and people can say what you know social media people can say whatever they want whether they know the facts or not. But um, you know our partners are happy. We feel we made a great deal here uh, and we're excited about the future and we think it sets us up really well for for the next 10 years. You know that I, I think that uh, there's been a great deal of discouragement uh, in uh, not just the country. There's been a lot of fear in the country, but there's been a lot of discouragement in uh, emergency medicine. Um, and we have um, w we've been worried about our our specialty. But uh, I think that as we look forward, uh, one of the things that uh, Dominic has really tried to emphasize is that this specialty is not going away. Uh, we're, we have a lot of a lot of uh, future, a, a lot of hope for uh, a brighter future. You may see that uh, in in a physician-owned group uh, like USACS. Uh, you may see it as uh, as an employee with uh, in, in other settings. But I think that our our specialty is well situated to to uh, take on the future and do well. So um, thank you, Dom. Uh, thank you for joining me, and and I, I look forward to this uh, podcast uh, all. Uh, through the weekend because I was anxious to ask you those questions. For our listeners, thank you for joining uh, EP Talk, uh, I, I, the place where uh, ER docs uh, come and talk about things that are important to us. And I think this is one of those, definitely one of those important topics. So thank you for joining us today. Hope you have a good day.